Good morning. I am really glad to be with you. Um, glad to have the opportunity to open God's Word with you this morning. My name is Gary Manning. I'm a professor at, uh, at Biola University Talbot School of Theology, and it's been my privilege to be um, Ed Gannigan's friend since way back. Uh, he and I were actually on staff um, at the, and we were part of planting a church more than 25, 27 years ago uh, back in Hawaii. And so um, it's really great to um, have the chance to spend time with you and communicate God's word with you this morning. And let me open in prayer before we read God's word. Lord, thanks so much uh, for the people who are at home this morning, um, joining uh, joining God's people from a distance. And um, Lord, I thank you so much for your word. It is so powerful. Uh, it is um, transformative. And so this morning, as we open your word, pray that your your spirit would um, would be at work in our hearts, enabling us to receive it and to respond to it. And um, Lord, we're thankful that you answer that kind of prayer. And we pray this in the name of your precious Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, what I want to talk about this morning is I want to start off by thinking about something that you feel hopeless about, okay? Something you feel hopeless about. Now, um, you might think, oh, I'm not, I don't feel particularly hopeless right now. I feel like things are going okay. But here's what I want to think, want you to think about is um, there are things that you may not emotionally feel hopeless about, but hopelessness is, boils down to when you start to think that the future is going to be pretty much like today, and today is not going the way it's supposed to be. So the kind of hopelessness I want us to think about is when you look at, a, let's say, a habit in yourself or a thought pattern in yourself, and you've worked on it long enough that you've decided, you know what, it's just not going to change. It, this is the way I am, and you sort of give up. This is the way I'm going to be. Or maybe it's um, dealing with with one of your kids, and, and you see something um, a pattern of life in one of your kids and you think you know what that's just the way it is I can't change it and that's just gonna that's the way it's gonna be um, maybe a, a relationship a damaged relationship with a with a, a family member a brother sis, brother or sister in Christ and um, you just kind of decide it's not gonna change and, and so even if you don't feel emotionally hopeless you get into a state of hopelessness when you decide things are not going to get any better. This is just the way it is. Sometimes we decide we decide that just we feel like we're being realistic. Uh, it hasn't changed before now. I've kept on trying and it's not working. So just to be realistic, to keep from uh, being discouraged, we decide things are going to stay the same. Uh, you know, uh, at the beginning of each year, a lot of us make uh, make resolutions, right? And a lot of times, um, you know, after making them for many years, eventually you think, you know what, I wasn't very good at making those resolutions last year, and so I'm not going to try this year either. We get into that sense of hopelessness. So what is it that you feel hopeless about? And, and ask that um, of yourself in the sense of, what is it that I've sort of decided isn't going to change? Or at least I've started to think um, in a fashion as if it's not going to change. And we're going to look today at a passage of Scripture um, Ezekiel chapter 37, where God addresses spiritual hopelessness. Uh, this, um, this sense of that I'm stuck, I can't solve my problem, and there is no solution to it, and so I feel hopeless. Um, Ezekiel chapter 37. Um, now, before we read it, in just a moment, I want to give a little bit of the background of Ezekiel chapter 37, uh, so we can see the, the hopelessness that this chapter attempts to address. Um, so Ezekiel is written right in those final years uh, before the fall of Jerusalem, um, years leading up to that. And then also um, there are some of Ezekiel's prophecies, some of his oracles that take place after the fall of Jerusalem. Um, this particular one, Ezekiel 37, is written after the fall of Jerusalem in the year 586 BC. Um, so um, Israel, um, the, the, the people that uh, this is written to, um, they are facing a kind of spiritual hopelessness that is probably worse than any of us will ever experience. Not just uh, not just about their spiritual condition, their entire condition. So the people who are listening to this, as Ezekiel proclaims it and then writes it down, have uh, suffered some incredible loss, more than more than most of us will ever experience. First, there's kind of the obvious one. They've, they've lost their beloved city. Um, Jerusalem has been destroyed. It is rubble. Um, the last uh, the last remnants of the people who lived there have now been carried off, and uh, the people Ezekiel's writing to, uh, they are now permanent refugees in Babylon. They are uh, outsiders 
who are not allowed to return, outsiders in Babylon, and they can't go back to their land. And if they could, they would go back to rubble, um, the city of Jerusalem destroyed. Uh, people in, Think of people we know of who are in war zones like Ukraine. Um, uh, if they even tried to, to return um, to their towns, for some of them, their towns are uh, a wasteland. And so there's a terrible despair about that. Um, there's thought people they know, every single person has lost loved ones, um, as Ezekiel writes to these people. So there's all these obvious areas of despair about their lives because they're, they've gone through war. They've gone through a terrible loss. But there's something even more serious. There's an even more serious despair that is going on um, in these exiles. And that is uh, they have lost the temple. Okay. Now, for us, we might think, oh, the temple is like a church. So if you and I lost our church building, it would be a disaster. But well, we could just go somewhere else. Um, we can go worship. We can worship anywhere. And so it doesn't seem to us quite the same if we just lost our church. Um, we, we're aware that our church is not, uh, the church is not a building. It's a group of people. But you see, the temple was different. For, the, for them, the temple actually was, in some special way, the dwelling place of God. When it was dedicated, um, when Solomon dedicated it, he, he said, yeah, we know that the, the world can't contain you, God, and yet in some special way you are dwelling in the temple. And in fact, God visibly entered the temple. His, his glory appeared in physically, uh, in, in visible form, and entered the temple. Um, in fact, at the beginning of the book of Ezekiel, one of the first visions that Ezekiel uh, shows tells us about is God leaving the temple. God leaves the temple because um, it has become utterly sinful and it's going to be destroyed. So God has left the temple, but now it's actually gone. Um, and they can't just go to a new place. You see, the temple was was sort of the, um, it was the place that you prayed toward uh, in Solomon's, um, Solomon's uh, prayer as he as the temple was dedicated he said we're going to face towards the temple when we pray because in some special sense god is present in the temple we so we turn and we pray towards that they encountered god in the temple in in a unique way and probably most importantly is their sins were dealt with through the temple now you and i today because of us living in the new covenant we our sins are forgiven and so we don't it's harder for us to take uh, it's harder for us to understand this because we trust in Jesus and our sins are taken care of. Um, they're forgiven through the sacrifice of Jesus. Um, but for them, their sins were forgiven through the sacrifices in the temple. If I sinned, I could go to the temple and make a sacrifice for that sin. And then there was lots of sins, of course, in daily life that I might overlook. But then there was the Day of Atonement, where there's a special sacrifice specifically to take care of all those sins that I'm unaware of. And so my sins were always taken care of through the temple. If I was a, an Israelite at this time, I suddenly realized there is no sacrifice taking place and there won't be for the rest of my life. There will be no sacrifices. So how are my sins dealt with? There's the, the, their Bible, the Old Testament, the law didn't give any other means for that forgiveness. Um, there's another thing that the temple took care of and that was dealing with ritual impurity. So, you know, when you read in the law and you find out um, that it says that if you touch certain things, you touch a dead body, you become unclean. Um, if you have certain kinds of illnesses, certain kinds of skin diseases, you become temporarily unclean. Now, uncleanness wasn't sin. I, I like to think of it as sort of like um, spiritual cooties. You touch it and you're like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm unclean. And the results, if you read through the law, like in Numbers 19, for example, um, if you became unclean, you weren't a sinner, but you couldn't participate in the temple. You couldn't participate. You couldn't join um, any sort of worship. You couldn't join the people of God in any sort of way until you became clean, until you were made clean. Well, how did you become clean? Well, some kinds of uncleanness were easy to deal with. Um, a, uh, just a, a ritual bath would take care of it. But there were certain kinds of uncleanness, like touching a dead body, that would, the only way to... Um, to become clean again was to use ashes from a temple sacrifice in water and then to be sprinkled with that water. Um, and Ezekiel was very familiar with this because he was not only a prophet, he was, he was also a priest. So that meant that if you touched a dead body, um, and you sometimes had to, if a family member died, you must take care of the dead body, but then you're unclean. And before, 
that's no problem. You can become clean again by following the law's requirements for ritual purification. But now what do you do? You touch a dead body and you are now unclean for the rest of your life. There's no way to deal with it. So there was a genuine despair. Their sins could not be taken care of. Their ritual impurity could not be taken care of. And um, uh, they were they were cut off from the rest of the people. Um, they were in this foreign land, this land of, of people who had defeated them and who did not worship their God and um, who wanted them to serve the nation of Babylon. Let's read the passage and kind of pick up on this impure, this uh, this hopelessness and see what God's response is to spiritual hopelessness. So Ezekiel 37, the hand of the Lord was upon me, Ezekiel says, and he brought me out by the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley and it was full of bones. He caused me to pass among them around about and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley and they were very dry. He said to me, son of man, which is God's title for Ezekiel, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know, Again, he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you that you may come to life. I will put sinews on you, make flesh grow back on you, cover you with skin and put breath in you that you may come alive and you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, Ezekiel says, and as I prophesied, there was a noise and behold, a rattling and the bones came together bone to bone. And I looked, and behold, sinews were on them, and flesh grew, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, or the wind, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, so that they come to life. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they came to life and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then God said to me, he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up, our hope has perished, we are completely cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves, my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves and caused you to come up out of your graves, my people. I will put my spirit within you and you will come to life and I will place you on your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and done it, declares the Lord. Now, let's take a look at the, first at the hopelessness that they experienced and then let's look at God's solution, his response to their hopelessness. Uh, look at uh, verse, verse three. God uh, puts him into this field of bones. Um, and uh, he says, God says to him, can these bones live? And of course, when God asks a question, he knows the answer. Ezekiel gives the right answer. He says, God, you know the answer. It's a good answer to God, okay? But there's certainly some depression there. I think that Ezekiel is feeling the same thing as his people, um, and he doesn't have confidence. Um, he is... Um, uh, he's ex having the same sense of, well, it looks pretty hopeless to me. Um, and look at this vision. Well, you know, why would God, what a stunning vision, first of all, right? Isn't this an amazing vision? All these bones lying there and click, 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 click. They all come back together. And as Ezekiel prophesies, and then they, the skin and flesh uh, builds, just forms upon them. And then the, the wind blows on them and they come alive. And they're this huge army. Um, so Ezekiel responds like his people, though. When he first sees the bones, there's like a battlefield there. There's all these human bones lying in this valley. And his, um, his, his thought is, I don't, I don't know. Um, I, this seems pretty hopeless to me. A bunch of bones on the ground. There's no hope here. This is a battlefield, right? Um, uh, in fact, those human bones there on the field, um, Ezekiel knows. And in fact, he wants his readers, the people he's, he's speaking to in these camps in Babylon, he wants them to think about Numbers 19, okay? Numbers 19 is the passage I just talked about, about ritual impurity. Um, in fact, it's kind of interesting. Numbers 19 specifically says, if you are in the field, that's what we have here, there are, Ezekiel is told to walk around the field, and you touch a human bone, you are unclean, okay? And notice what God told Ezekiel. God put him in this field full of bones, and he said, Ezekiel, walk around. Walk around through these piles of bones. Ezekiel is forced in his vision to become unclean. He, he has to do it because God just told him to do it. And he's a priest, so he takes ritual purification um, really seriously. 
So God is kind of trying to visualize for Ezekiel the situation that all of Israel finds themselves in. And that is that they have touched unclean things. Um, they're, ritual, they're ritually unclean and they can't do anything about it. And that adds to the, the picture also of the fact that they have sinned. And there's no solution for their sin as far as they know. So um, these bones are supposed to make them think of this, this hopelessness. God wants to fully acknowledge their hopelessness. Look at verse, uh, verse 11. In verse 11, um, God says, there's a saying going around. Here's what people of Israel are saying, okay? God, God says, I'm listening. I hear what they're saying. Verse 11, the whole house of Israel, behold, they say our bones are dried up. Now, that's not a phrase you and I use, but you can tell what they mean, right? My bones are dry. I, I just, I am completely without hope. My bones are dried up. Um, God says, so you know what? I've been hearing that. Ezekiel, I'm going to give you a picture. Dry bones. In fact, those dry bones are going to make you unclean as well. Listen to what else the people of Israel are saying. Um, our hope has perished. Can you hear that? I, I can hear it. Their hope has perished. Their city is gone. Their temple is gone. They've lost family and friends. They're exiled in a foreign land. Then they say, we are completely cut off. We are completely cut off. Do you know what that phrase is used for? As you go back in the Old Testament to the law, those people who have become unclean are described as cut off from the assembly. They cannot participate in the assembly. If somebody, certain kinds of sin, that when people, um, uh, certain types of sin cause people to be cut off from the assembly, from the people of God in Israel, they, they're they're exiled, they're sent away. So when the Israelites here say we are completely cut off, they're saying because of our uncleanness, because of our sin, we are cut off from, from connection to God, connection to God's people. Um, notice it says that there, uh, God says in verse 12, um, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will open your graves. You see, the people of Israel in Babylon felt like they were dead. They felt like, I'm in the grave. And Babylon is filled with unclean things because, of course, Babylonians didn't follow any of Israel's laws. So lots of things were unclean. And so they felt dead. They felt spiritually dead. Um, and you know what? Uh, what I want you to get here is this is not just a problem of bad attitude by the Israelites. They are actually accurately assessing their situation. They are accurately recognizing that they have lost their city and that their sin problem cannot be dealt with and their uncleanness problem cannot be dealt with anymore because the temple is gone and they have no solution. And so their hopelessness is, um, is, is a, in one sense, it's a correct hopelessness. Um, it's a correct evaluation that they have no solution um, and they, they, don't, they don't have, they can't think of anything else to do. So their situation of hopelessness is probably worse than what you or I will ever experience. Um, it's not only the situation of being a refugee, but they feel like there is no way of getting back to God. There's no way of getting right with God. So what does God do when he sees us despairing over our spiritual condition? What does God do when he sees us hopeless, unable to solve something? Well, look at how he responds to the Israelites first, and then we'll talk about how that applies to us. First, I want to really want you to notice that God hears. He genuinely hears and understands our situation. He understands our despair. He understands our hopelessness. In fact, he goes so far as God has been listening, and he's hearing people say, our bones are dry. And God says, I'm going to repeat that back to you, but I'm going to repeat it back to you with a stunning vision to show you that you're right. You're hopeless. You're, there's no solution. I'm going to, I'm going to hear fully your despair. And you know why this matters so much? You ever, you ever ex try to explain your situation to somebody and they say, I hear you. And, but you think, nope, they don't really hear me. They don't, uh, they don't really understand my situation. Um, uh, sometimes as I, uh, we have a bunch of kids and, um, uh, my youngest is um, 10 and my oldest is 27. We also have two grandkids. And so if, if you're a parent like me, you've gone through situations with your kids where you feel like um, you feel hopeless, right? Um, and sometimes as I've dealt with with situations with my kids, I'll have somebody say, oh yeah, I, I can I can understand what you're going through. And maybe they can, but sometimes I think, no, no, you don't know what I'm going through. <laughs> you, you don't know. I'm dealing with some situations that you have not dealt with. Um, and, and probably all of us feel like that sometimes. Like I'm going through a situation and nobody can really understand. Um, and what this passage shows here is that God does. 
he not only hears them, but you notice he verbalizes back to them, which is a good counseling technique, right? Is to verbalize back. Uh, God uh, verbalizes the, the, their despair. He says, you know what I heard? Here's what I heard from you guys. Our bones are dry. Uh, we are completely cut off. Uh, can these bones live? There's the, he, God hears this sense of despair. So I, what I want you to pick up first of all from this passage is that we, we don't have a distant God. We don't have a God who is way out there. Um, we don't have a mechanical God who has just set up a system that we have to respond to. We have a compassionate God who enters into our despair, who enters into our sense of hopelessness. Um, you know, uh, as a dad, I, I want to hear my kids as they talk about the issues they face. And as especially as kids go through their teenage years, they, there's things that they want to communicate. But I know I'm, I'm not very good at it sometimes. I know sometimes I'm listening to my kids and, and I'm trying to have compassion. Um, but I... I I'm probably not hearing them fully. I'm trying to, but not like God does. Um, this passage reminds us that God is the only one who fully undersp understands our emotional condition and our spiritual condition, and um, he can verbalize it. In fact, he not just verbalizes it, but gives this absolutely stunning vision that recognizes um, our, our situation. And that's true. Whatever situation, remember I asked you at the beginning to think about something that... Um, that you feel hopeless about, God understands that fully. Um, he can recite back to you exactly how you feel, um, and he understands uh, every emotion that is going on related to that situation you're thinking about here. So that's the first thing in this vision is that God fully hears. Um, he fully understands our hopelessness, our sense of despair. The second thing is, as the second part of this vision, though, shows that God is going to meet their deep need. He's going to meet their deepest need um, and uh, he, he's not, you know, sometimes we, we, have, a good, we have a good friend who um, we share a problem we're going through and our friend says, man, I hear you and we believe it and we feel like, yeah, this is so good to be heard. But your friend can't do anything about it. Right? Your friend can't solve the problem for you. Here's the amazing thing about God is he hears their, their despairing condition and he says, I'm going to meet your need. He sends a message of hope through his messenger, Ezekiel. He says, I'm going to send them a message. They're all going to hear this message. Um, that, that God is uh, preparing to meet their deep need. He says, I'm going to take you out of your graves. Babylon feels like a grave right now. I'm going to take you out. Um, uh, they think they want the temple back to deal with their sin and their ritual purity. They, they do need that. But God says, I'm going to solve it in a different way. Um, I'm going to solve your problem, not just with the temple, but with my spirit dwelling inside of you to deal with not just the, they may think they have, they, they, they want to deal with their sin and their ritual impurity. God says, I'm going to do something more than that. My response is to do something even greater. And that is I'm going to deal with your spiritual deadness by giving you my spirit. Look at some of God's promises that he gives to the Israelites to help them, to help them see that not only he hears uh, their condition, but he's going to deal with it. So he says in verse 12, he says, um, I'm going to open your grave. So right now you feel like you're dead, right? He says, Israelites say, man, I feel like I'm dead in the land of Babylon. God says, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to make you alive back in the land that God gave him. There, a time is coming when I'm going to send you back to the land. So I'm going to give you exactly what you want there. You're going to be back in the land. It takes a while, but it's going to happen. They say, you know, I feel unclean. I feel unholy. I'm un unforgiven. Not just feel. They are unclean, unholy, and unforgiven. God says, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to fill you with my Holy Spirit. You will have, it's not just going to be about a building that is holy, but my personal Holy Spirit, God says, is going to be dwelling inside of you. Um, you're, you're all going to be filled with God's Holy Spirit. They feel cut off, right? They feel cut off from God. They feel cut off from his people. They are cut off from God and his people. It's not just a feeling. Look at how God responds in verse 13. He says, my people, my people. He says it twice. God's saying, letting them know, no, you are still my people. Um, and um, he says, look, look what he says. You will know that I am the Lord. You will know that I'm the Lord. What is he doing there? He's letting them know that there is a relationship that exists right now, and it's going to be even greater in the future. You will know that I am the Lord. You will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and have done it. Um, in verse uh, 14, God is letting them know that there's something that's going to happen that's going to make the relationship with him even greater than what they're hoping for. Um, he's going to restore them not just to where they were, but to something even greater. So how does God do this? How does God solve this problem that they have of being dead and cut off and spiritually hopeless? Well, it's it's CPR, okay? Um, he gives them CPR. So in Hebrew, 
Um, there's one word that means three things. That's pretty common in language, right? A lot of words have several meanings. The word ruach. Ruach can mean spirit, breath, or wind. Spirit, breath, or wind. In fact, in translating this passage, it's not always trying to find the best way to translate it um, to get the vision across is a little a little bit hard here. Um, it's hard to pick the best one necessarily. So notice that at the end of the vision, though, God says, Ezekiel, I want you to prophesy over those. Now, there's a, these bodies, first they grow skin, they link together, the, the um, and then flesh and skin grows on them. But now we have a bunch of dead bodies. So God says, I want you to do one more thing. I want you to prophesy to the ruach, the wind. And the, I want that wind to breathe breath, ruach, into these people. Um, and then they're going to come alive. And we might think, what's that vision all about? Fortunately, God explained what that is. If you go to the second part, verse 14, as God explains his vision, he says, I will put my spirit, my ruach, in them. So this picture of dead bodies on the ground and wind rushing into them, and they, come, they stand up, they're alive now, is a picture of God's ruach, God's spirit, going into them and dwelling in them and making them come alive. The breath is God's promise of the future giving of the Spirit to the people of Israel. And that's going to be much better than the temple. It's going to be much better than being back in Jerusalem. This picture, by the way, um, Ezekiel is asked, God through Ezekiel, is asking the Israelites to remember Genesis 2. I want you to imagine Ezekiel coming back from this vision and going into the camps there, and he begins talking to the um, to the Israelites and explaining to them what he just saw from God, and he uses these words that they're so familiar with from their Bible, from the Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, from uh, the first part of the Old Testament. And when he says, um, when he says, God told me to prophesy to these bodies lying on the ground, and to to cause the wind to breathe into them and they come alive. What are they going to think about? Well, that happened once, a long time ago. Genesis 2. God formed Adam, dust from the earth, but then he's just a body lying on the ground. What does God do next? He breathes into Adam and makes this lifeless body on the ground. He takes this lifeless body on the ground and he breathes into it, breathes into it the breath of life, and Adam becomes a living being. And so the people of God who hear Ezekiel prophesying, they think, oh, that's right. Yeah, I've been saying this phrase. I've been saying my bones are dry. We're in the tomb. I feel dead. And But you know what? God can take bodies and make them come alive like he did with Adam. And Ezekiel uses these words drawn directly from Genesis 2 um, to help, uh, help the Israelites understand that God, if you feel dead, well, <laughs> then you've come to the right place because God can raise the dead. Um, he can breathe into them the breath of life. Um, but this isn't about literal physical raising from the dead, although God can do that as well. It's about people who feel dead because of their sin, because of their uncleanness, and God's going to give them the Holy Spirit. Now, this draws us into something that's all over the Old Testament, and that is God's promise of the future gift of the Holy Spirit. Um, and uh, if you read through, there's a good about, about a dozen major passages in the prophets where the prophets say, hey, in the future, God is going to put his Holy Spirit not just into a few people, but into all of God's people. They're all going to receive the Spirit. And when that happens, their hearts are going to be transformed. A great passage in this is the chapter before um, that we're looking at, it, Jack, back in Ezekiel chapter 36, um, 36, 24. Um, and God describes it as like a heart transplant. He says, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. That's about that purification we talked about. I will cleanse you from your filthiness and from your idols. That is, your sins will be dealt with. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, spirit, heart and spirit transplant. I get God's spirit within me, and I will remove the heart, uh, God says, of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. So all over the Old Testament, there's this promise that God is going to give his Holy Spirit. Um, and so as the exiles are in despair, God speaks to them and says, yes, you feel despairing, you feel dead. My spirit will come in you and will deal with your sin, will deal with your uncleanness, and will create a relationship with me, a relationship unlike anybody had experienced uh, before then. Well, when did this happen? Okay, God made the promise. Some of the promise happened sooner. They were returned to the land. Jerusalem was rebuilt. The temple was rebuilt, but the Holy Spirit didn't come yet. When did that happen? Well, I want, you, I want to read a great passage from the Gospel of John. In the Gospel of John, John chapter 20, verse 21, Jesus appears to his disciples in the upper room after his resurrection. And Jesus says to them, verse 21, 
he says again to them, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. You can almost translate this, he breathed into them. In fact, as Jesus says this, as John writes it, he uses the same Greek word that, that's used in Ezekiel 37 um, in the Greek, uh, the Greek Old Testament to describe the wind breathing into the dead bodies and making them come to life. And it's an extremely rare word. It occurs just a few times in the Old Testament and only once in the New Testament. So when Jesus did this, when he breathed into the disciples, he was saying loud and clear, the promise from Ezekiel 37 of the gift of the Spirit is coming true now. Now, there was other things that happened that are that are part of that whole giving of the Spirit, like Acts 2. But here, after the resurrection, Jesus says, I'm giving you the Holy Spirit, and I'm giving you peace, and I'm sending you out. Um, as he described in John 20, Jesus breathed out the Spirit, and they received this promise, this promise of a heart transplant, this promise of a new spirit within them, uh, this promise of a relationship with God and forgiveness and dealing with with uh, ritual impurity it is all all provided through the Holy Spirit. Um, I love uh, I love C.S. Lewis's books, *Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe*, the whole Narnia series. You may remember um, that uh, Lewis uh, grabbed the hold of this image um, from John twenty um, in the witch's castle, imprisoned. The witch had imprisoned all of these people, um, and she had turned them into statues. They look like they're dead. And when Aslan rescues them, how does he do it? He goes from one statue to the other and he breathes on them. And as he breathes on them, they come alive. And in fact, throughout the Narnia books, um, uh, very often Aslan breathes on people and they feel the strength of the lion coming into them. Um, and um, that was a wonderful, wonderful way that Lewis grabbed a hold of this beautiful picture from uh, from the Bible, from Ezekiel, and from the Gospel of John. Okay, so what do we? How do we respond to this? God gave this wonderful response. He says, "I see your hopelessness, and I have a response. I understand it, and I'm going to give you a solution um, to your deep need. The Holy Spirit will be a gift that I give to you, who will transform your hearts and deal with your sin." Jesus fulfilled that for us. So, what do we do? You see. The future hope for the exiles, this promise that was going to be fulfilled down the line, is now a reality for us. You and I have the Holy Spirit. Um, multiple places in the New Testament promise that when you and I trust in Jesus, we receive that gift. The Holy Spirit comes into us and begins the, that transformation of our heart. Um, he empowers us to change. He empowers us uh, to know God. He empowers us to be the temple of God as the Spirit dwells inside of us. So how do we respond when we feel that sense of hopelessness. Well, the first thing I would suggest is thankfulness. Um, part of our response is to recognize, you know what? God already dealt with this. He already responded. He already gave us a solution um, in the Holy Spirit. The second thing, in addition to thankfulness, that's trust. Um, when you and I feel this, um, this sense of hopelessness, that's the time to cry out to God. Um, when we cry out to God in hopelessness, that's an act of faith because we recognize I can't do anything about this, um, but God, your spirit can. I'm crying on you to do this. Um, God, we say, I, I don't have hope. I feel dead. And God's response is, you come to the right place because I can raise the dead. God has already provided. And so we need to respond um, in thankfulness and trust. We have to recognize that the Spirit actually can transform. Some of the biggest transformations in my life have come when I've thrown up my hands and said, can't do anything. I have this very clear memory of something that now happened uh, 40 years ago, almost. Um, I remember I was a new driver and I was, I remember the precise spot where I was in Kailua about to make a left turn um, off of Oneava um, Street uh, to Kailua uh, Road. And I, suddenly had a clear picture of a problem in the way I thought, a problem in my thought patterns that I judged people and I was prideful um, and I thought I was better than other people. And I thought my first response was, I can't do anything about it. There is no hope. The spirit, I think, was prompting me to recognize that in myself. And I thought, I can't do anything about it. How do you change the way you think? And while I was waiting for the light to turn green, I thought, God, you got to do something about this because I sure can't. And I actually began to notice over the next next year or so, 
that there actually was a change in the way I thought. It's not, there, I still have a lot more to go even now, 40 years later. But that moment of saying, God, you, I can't do anything about it. I'm hopeless, uh, was a key moment in my life of recognizing that God could change things. I want to tell you a quick story in closing about a guy who was given a hopeless assignment. Um, there was a U.S. Army chaplain. I read his biography, Henry Garricky. Henry Garricky was a Lutheran uh, chaplain who was assigned uh, uh, as a chaplain during World War II. He was ministering to troops um, throughout the war. He was given a very interesting assignment, a hopeless assignment near the end of the war. And that is, um, they found out that Henry could speak fluent German uh, because his parents were German and uh, he was a U.S. citizen, but he could speak German. And they had a bunch of Germans in prison who needed a chaplain. But those Germans in prison were people like Hermann Goering and Hess and Donitz, Nazi war criminals who were waiting trial. The United States government wanted to do everything above board. They wanted to make sure that um, they granted chaplain chaplains to their prisoners as they awaited trial. So Henry Garricky went in with a sense of what is the point? These are some of the worst people ever in history and I'm supposed to go and minister to them. So he went from cell to cell and offered to pray um, and to minister to all of these war criminals, people who had overseen uh, the, uh, uh, the Holocaust, um, people who had overseen terrible atrocities by, the, by Hitler's army. Um, seems absolutely impossible, but he was determined to do what his assignment was and to offer, uh, offer to pray with these people. Well, uh, the responses were predictable. Um, there was scoffing, there was um, people who said there was no way they even wanted to talk with him. Goering absolutely refused to talk with him. Um, uh, but interestingly, a few people said, yeah, you can come in and pray. Um, Wilhelm Keitel was a German field marshal and his was guilty of terrible crimes. He oversaw the Eastern Army um, that was responsible before the Holocaust. Um, among the, of they, before the Holocaust fully started, they would round up Jewish people and other undesirables and shoot them in the fields. Um, that was what he oversaw. Um, responsible for terrible atrocities against the people of the, in the East, the Eastern places that um, they had invaded. Um, uh, two other uh, army people who were charged with war, tro war crimes, Ribbentrop and Saukel, uh, all said, yeah, we'll pray with you. And over time, as they were waiting their trial, they came to repentance. They repented of their terrible sins um, and they spent their final days studying the Bible and praying with, with uh, Henry Garricky. Um, uh, as the various criminals were convicted and went to the gallows to hang, um, there was totally different responses. For example, Stryker, uh, Julius Stryker, as he went to the gallows, he cried out, Heil Hitler. Um, most people were utterly unrepentant, in fact, proclaimed their loyalty to Hitler even in death. But Keitel said this as he went to the gallows. Um, he said, Christ's blood and judgment are my adornment and robe of honor. In, in them I will stand before God when I go to heaven. Amen. And he was, he, he paid for his crimes, but of course he now stands before God forgiven, even for those terrible crimes. Um, the, uh, it may seem impossible for people to change, especially people like these, these war criminals. Um, but, uh, Chaplain Garricky, instead of giving into um, his uh, into hopelessness and despair, said, I'm going to carry out what God has assigned me. I'm going to pray. I'm going to be faithful. And I'm going to trust God's spirit. And because of that, three people repented and showed the power of, uh, of God's uh, spirit in changing these people's lives. Most of us have a lot less to change, a lot less to repent of than these terrible Nazi war criminals. Um, you know, as we finish this passage, I want you to again think about whatever it was you were thinking that feels hopeless. And I want you to go back to what we found out from Ezekiel, from God's message through Ezekiel and from Jesus in John chapter 20. Remember first that God sees that despair you have. He sees that sense that you can't change anything. He sees it. He knows it better than anyone. And he responds by saying, I am going to meet your deep need. Maybe not in the way you think. It may be something even, something even more. And because of that, because we're aware that God has given his spirit to um, respond to that deep need, as he promised the people of Israel in Ezekiel 37, we already have that promise. 
we respond with thankfulness. Okay, God, you've already provided. And we respond in trust. Okay, God, I, I, I have to recognize that I fall short. I have no ability to deal with this, but I recognize that your spirit can. And so I'm trusting completely in your spirit to deal um, with this thing that feels so hopeless. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for um, the fact that you see us fully. You are compassionate. You understand the things that we despair about. You uh, recognize that we um, are unable um, to deal with our sin, unable to deal with um, our habits that seems, seem just impossible to change. And so you've provided a solution, your Holy Spirit, given through Jesus, given because of his death and resurrection. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be thankful for that solution and then to trust it, to keep on over and over again, turning and saying, I can't solve this. Holy Spirit, you can. And we know that you will answer that prayer. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.